reading verses 1 through 11. Uh, Mark is one of the four Gospels. In fact, Mark dedicates over a third of his Gospel to the last week of Jesus' life. We begin uh, in verse 1, chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why you're doing this, say the Lord needs it and we'll, we'll bring it back here shortly. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He, said, he sat on it and many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the field. Those who went ahead and those who followed uh, shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went to Bethany to be with the twelve. May God bless the reading of his word and all who hear it this day. Well, since you are here, there are so many of you here today, I have to tell you that it has been a long year, of course, we've been apart, and there's two things that I have missed greatly, all right? Well, actually, three. I see we have children now, and that's probably number one on the list. I missed our time with our kids. Uh, The second thing is, um, I am locked behind this holy desk. I like to walk around, as you know. I like to come out. In fact, I, I love the interaction that we have sometimes when, when we could have that before. Uh, but that we have to keep apart. So I am locked up here in this desk, and sometimes it does feel very restrictive. Okay, the third thing is, because there's nobody here, somebody will say, why don't you tell stories? Because there's just nobody here to tell a story to. Okay, so if you came for a story today, I have one for you. It happens to actually be relative to our message today. And our message today is about what is your hope? What is your hope for tomorrow? So as we go through life, we have different times in our lives that we have different things that we aspire to, things that we hope. Now, I'm not talking about wish. I wish I had a million bucks, but I'm not going to do anything to get it. That's not going to happen. Hope. I wish I could, I, 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 I want, I, I hope for to have this thing happen. I either attain a job or whatever it is that I want, and I'm, and I'm focused on it. I have energy towards it, and I'm gonna to move towards it. So I'm hoping that it all works out. So what is your hope for tomorrow? So the story, 80-year-old man goes fishing to his favorite fishing hole, and he is sitting along the river there fishing, and he hears a soft voice. And he's looking around, and he cannot figure out who's talking to him. There's nobody else there. And he finally looks down and he sees a frog sitting there next to him. And that's where it's coming from. And from the frog it says, I am a beautiful princess trapped in the body of a frog by a spell. Pick me up and kiss me and I will be yours forever and we will live in my kingdom. He's looking at the frog. He's listening to the frog some more. He reaches down, picks up the frog, and puts it in his pocket, loads up all his fishing gear, and starts heading back home. At this point, the frog is screaming, Hey, didn't you understand? I am a beautiful princess. All you have to do is kiss me. The spell will be removed, and I will live with you forever. To which the man responds, At my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. (laughs) Okay, I would not, but that's okay. So, At every age, we have different ideas, different hopes, and that's what we're going to talk about today. What is your hope for tomorrow? Is it peace? Is it security? Is it reconciliation? Is it comfort? Is it love? And is it a real hope, not just a wish? Is there something that gives you that hope? Is there something that draws you towards it, some energy, some strength, some some hope that that could actually happen? Okay, that's where we're going to go, but before I want to tell you another story, if you will uh, indulge me. Uh, I'm going to go through a change in my life, uh, not, a, not, a, not a midlife crisis, didn't buy another motorcycle, nothing like that. But on the 11th of November in 1990, I went through a tremendous change. I witnessed my youngest daughter go from cabbage patch to new kids on the block. 
Now, if you don't know who New Kids on the Block are, you are stuck in one age group or the other. New Kids on the Block, it is what is, for lack of a, term, a better term, a boy band, a guy's a small group of rock and roll band. I found that my young daughter had now put all of her cabbage patch away and had all these posters of these guys in her room. And then the worst thing happened, well, not the worst thing, but the next thing that happened is she says, they're coming to Ames. And I said, oh, okay. But, but her friends were also telling her, they're coming to Ames. We need to go see them. So, oh, a friend's dad and I talked about it, and we said, well, you know what, we should take them. So we acquired tickets, and he came back and said, I could only get three. I think he lied about that. He said, and I can't go, so who gets to go with the two girls? Me. So we go to Ames, Hilton Coliseum. You've been there before. You've been there for games and maybe concerts. And I've been there for concerts before in games. And we get there, and we go, and our tickets are in the nosebleed section. Have you been in the nosebleed section of, of Hilton Coliseum? Uh, I, you know, I may be old. It was even old then. But I knew if you're going to see a concert, you do not want to see it from the nosebleed section. It's a way different show if you can be down closer. So I go to the attendant who was there who got it seated. And I explained, no, we've driven a long ways. And I didn't say an hour and a half. I wasn't in ministry then. I didn't say how long it was. But I said, we've driven all this way. I've got these two little girls. They came here to see the new kids on the block. And we can't see anything from behind the beam up here. He said, well, let me see what I can do. He went and he talked to, must have been his boss, and this lady came back and she said, follow me. I'm going, yes. So we start down the steep steps and we go from this nosebleed section to the next section down and I'm thinking, okay, not great, but better, better. But she keeps going. And she goes down farther and down farther and we're all the way down to the first level balcony. I'm thinking, this can't be, this is just awesome. I, I got to keep my mouth shut, but this, she kept going. And she went down onto the main floor in front of the stage, and she seated us in row 13, right in front of the stage. That's right where Alex is sitting right now. And my little girl looked at me, and she thought I was the magic man. This was the highest pinnacle of anything I have ever done for her. Even all the cabbage patches we bought didn't mean anything to what I could see in her now. So then the, the concert begins, and they, they have a prep band, and then they start. And i got to tell you, I, the biggest mistake I made for the night, I did not bring hearing protection. Have you ever heard thousands of little girls between the age of 12 and 16 scream all at the same time? That is why I still don't have hearing in my left ear. But anyway, okay, so I covered my ears as the, as the night went on and the concert was going on. And then when I kept thinking we had reached the pinnacle, we had not yet. Two of the guys in the band strapped on harnesses and flew out over the crowd that was down on the floor, which we were now part of. And my little girl is jumping up and down. I didn't know she could jump that high. And she's jumping up and down and she's screaming something in my ear, the which I had plugged. And, but, and, and I finally unplugged it to hear, Donnie Wahlberg sweat on me. <laughs> and it's the happiest I've ever seen this young kid. All her hopes and dreams and beyond had come true. Now, I'm not real happy about some guy sweating on my daughter, but it is amazing to see when our dreams and hopes come true. What are your hopes for tomorrow? What are you hoping for? What are you wanting to happen? I want to talk to you about another rock star. There have always been rock stars throughout history, even in Old Testament times and even in New Testament times. Old Testament times, there was King David, there was Moses, there was Samson. There were all those who people wanted to be around because of the great things that they had done. And certainly Jesus, in the three-year ministry that, had, that he had, he had become a rock star. People wanted to be around him. If they knew he was going to be there, they were going. And it, but, it, but it was for a reason that, we, that most people who are famous uh, do differently. He did not stay in the best hotels. He did not eat the best food. He did not hang out with the kings and all the people in power. Didn't even hang out with the religious leaders. He hung out with the people, everyday people, people like you and me. The imperfect people, the prostitutes, the task collectors. That great philosopher Garth Brooks had it right. He had friends in low places. 
And that is why he became such a wonderful, wonderful person for people. And when they knew he was coming, they knew it was okay to be close to him. So as he was coming to Jerusalem and the word spread, they all came and they walked ahead of him and they walked behind him. And they were all along the way that he was because they wanted to be close to him. They wanted to hear his voice. They wanted to breathe the same air. And yes, it was probably somebody that was going to get sweat on. All of that because they were drawn to this person, Jesus, because of what he had become to them. He had healed them. He had fed them. He had preached this wonderful, life-giving word of God to them. And it connected with them. And he became their hope. But there was something different about the hope that they had in him. And this is the same thing that can happen to us. As we have hope in this life, as we hope for tomorrow, as we look at what we want to, be, want to accomplish or what we want to be or what we want to happen, are we trusting in ourselves and other men or are we trusting in God? Are we trusting God's plan to get us there? Are we trusting that there is something beyond our own limitations and our own strength? Or are we looking at it just from a, from a very physical standpoint that it's going to take this to make this happen, and that's what I want, and that's where I'm going, and, and heck with it, that's it. And when they looked at Jesus, they had a misunderstanding of what he was doing and how this, they might be hopeful and what they might get from him. They were looking for a physical king, a physical kingdom. They were looking for him to set up a kingdom just like they lived under before with King David and King Solomon. And, and they would rise up and be a great people and they would kick the Romans out of, out of Israel. They would get rid of all the religious leaders who, were, who were, had them in bondage and they would get rid of their own uh, leaders who were not good leaders and they would rise up and they would be prosperous and they would be happy and they could be free. And they thought that he, the Messiah, was an earthly king, but he came to do much more. And sometimes that happens to us even today. We look at him and we have a hope, we have an expectation, we have something we want, but it's physical. Jesus, I love you because I want you to make me rich. Now, that's a statement you would never say out loud, but there are some people that believe that. I will live a better life if I am following Jesus. I'm following him not because of the life that he wants to give me, but because of the life I want him to. To, to, to give me. I have my own ideas on what should be good. They missed it. They missed it. And that's why this next week was so, so traumatic for many of them. Jesus came in on a high point. They're, they're saying, Hosanna, they were, love this guy. And by the end of the week, these same people were yelling out, crucify him. Because of all the events that happened during the week that took away from this great Messiah, this great king that they thought they would be. He was betrayed by his own. He was denied by his own. He was taken out in, in front of all these people after being whipped, and they were going to crucify him, and he didn't have the power, it looked like, he did not have the power to save himself, then how could they save all of them? They looked at him and said, well, he must not be the guy. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had faith in someone? Someone was going to do something for you, but then you find out they can't? And that's the experience that they had. They looked at him, they, they had no idea of the real mission. And now, 2,000 years later, we have that great gift of knowing that it's how we end the week, how we start the next week is more important than, than how the week may go. Because, you know, our life is like that too. It's a roller coaster. Things seem to go bad, and it seems like we are not victorious, we are losing, but in the midst of that, we may be gaining. We may actually be victorious. And the other thing that, that we miss, and they missed, even as Jesus went to the cross and died for, for our sins, is that many people even today think, okay, Jesus went to the cross and he died for our sins. You know, that was not the great sacrifice. That was not the miracle. That wasn't the reason he came. He came to rise again. Anybody can die for somebody else. You could die for me in my place if you wanted to, if you cared for me enough. But you could not rise again. Jesus died, took all of our sins to the cross, and rose again to give us the gift of life. And that's what we need to believe, and that's what we need to understand. And I want to tell you three things about God because of this sacrifice. First of all, what this sacrifice in this whole roller coaster week that you and I are about to go through it proves that there is a God and God loves you. There's always a question because I can't touch it, feel it, smell it, grab it. Is God really out there? 
I've had enough experiences to know that there's something out there, and it's bigger than me, and it's better than me, and, and you can call it whatever you want to, I call it God. And all of this is telling me that this is not just a man doing this. This is God loves me enough to come here and to show me that God is real and God loves me. I don't deserve it. There is nothing that I've ever done to deserve that. But God loves me because I am a creation of God, created in God's image, which is even scarier yet, is that not? Okay, the second thing is that God wants us to live. God does not want us to die. You and I were not created to die. But yet we know that that is the biggest enemy that you and I face. We're not getting off planet Earth alive, okay? Not unless you go to Mars. But you, we're not leaving this world alive, but yet God wants us to live. The original creation of Adam and Eve were not to die. They were to be continuous companions to God and to live on. So God has reconciled us not to just forgive our sins and make a little th things a little bit better here and all that, but he wants us to live forever, and the only way he can do that is have us live in eternity forever with him. And he's made a way for us to do that. In, in that, he has taught us something. He has taught us that many of us are measuring life all wrong. Most of us, and many of us, if you were talk, talking about someone's life, you can go right to their gravestone, you can go right to mine, although they haven't filled in the last numbers yet. You can go right to mine, and you see a, a date of birth, and you see a date of death. And you say, that's the person's life, and that's what we talk about. But that, God doesn't see it that way. God sees us living far beyond before we show up and come out of our mother's womb. We are alive in the womb. We are alive. If you read, the, read, read David's testimonies within, within the Psalms, God, God looks at us in the womb and, and molds us in the womb. And then we have this mistaken idea, many people do, is that the day they put you in the ground, your life is over. But God doesn't see it that way. God thinks that it's endless, that you have the opportunity to live forever. That's what you were created for. And yet we as humans, we live in this narrow scope of birth and death and think this is all there is, this is the best it's going to be, the most toys I can get before I die, then I win. All those things we look at and think that this is, is the scope of our life, and it is not. And what Jesus came to show us and to give us the gift of life is that we expand who we are, expand our life. And truly, someday you and I will step across to the other side, and we will see each other again. And for some of you, that may be a good thing. Some of you may not. <laughs> but anyway, we will always know each other, I believe, because we are God's person. We are God's child. And we will live forever. And I also know that, I also think that, that I'm probably going to be surprised by some of the people I run into there. And they're probably going to be real surprised to see me, okay? But that's okay, because God is so loving and so generous. And, and, and I have talked to many people who wonder if their loved ones have ever given their heart to Jesus. I want to tell you that God does not let that slip by to the last breath, to the last moment. He is right there with every person so that they might have that opportunity for eternal life. That's how much we are, are loved. The last thing is, the last of those three things, is that God will change things in our life we don't expect. I didn't expect my daughter to get sweat on by some guy at the concert. And i got to tell you, life, God will take you to places and experiences that you will not expect. I am living proof of that, and you are as well. You know that God takes us on this road sometimes, and sometimes it feels like we're losing, but we're really not. Sometimes it feels like we're going up and down and all around, and, and we're not making any forward progress, and is it, we're, we're stalled, or people are treating us badly, or we're just wiped out, or we're sick, or all kinds of things, and we're not making any forward progress to our hope, and we think there's nothing good happening, but actually you are in the throes of victory even as that happens. Sometimes I have to laugh at myself at, the, at 6.45 in the mornings when I've been at exercise, and, and I stop exercising at 6.45, and I look around, and the mat looks like a crime scene because I've sweat so much and I can't take another breath, and it looks like I have lost, looks like I'm on my last breath, but yet inside I know it's victory. Inside, I know that I am stronger now than I was when I started, that I will be stronger, I will be better for my family, better for my life, better for everything I do because I have put forth that effort and that work and when people think that I am losing, I am not because I am in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. 
And you and I, sometimes when we follow the Lord, we are ridiculed for it. It looks like we're losing. We're ostracized for it. They think we're crazy because we're Christian. They think we're weak-minded because we're Christian. They think that because we bring Christian values into our homes and our schools and a place of work, that there's something wrong with us. And we are, you know, don't listen to that guy. He's a little bit nuts. But in fact, that's victory. Because someone's life will be touched and changed because of it. Because we have taken the truth that we have learned and we have shared it. That is what we are to be about. What is your hope for tomorrow? Is it coming from men or is it coming from God? Is it, is it a wish that, hey, it's outside of everything that could possibly happen, but yeah, it would be great if it did? Or is it a true hope? Are you locked in on something? Is there something that's pushing your energy towards it? Is it a true hope? And I pray that you can identify what that is. And I know it changes daily. It changes by the years. It changes when you're 8 or when you're 80. It All of this through our life. But we always have hope because we're always looking forward. We're always looking for a better day and we'll make it that way. And if we are seeking that through our Lord Jesus Christ, then we will be on track. We will be on target. And not only in reaching that for ourselves, but taking others along with us. You know, I think about what that might have been on that day when Jesus answered Jerusalem to be there. You know, there, there used to be this, um, uh, I don't know if we got any, we, we may have someone old enough here to remember a TV show, black and white TV show, and the TV show was You Are There. I don't know if you ever remember it. It was actually a historical one, and it would take you back to these things that were happening in history and actually let you see them, you know, like they were first, first place, you were like in the crowd. And I, so it kind of makes me think, you know, I what, wonder what it would have been like to be in that crowd. You know, I probably would have been like most of them. I probably would have had a misunderstanding. I would have thought he was the greatest thing, yes. Great rock star, great healer, great person, good man. But I may have looked upon him, even in that light, as a, as a worldly and physical Messiah. And in that case, I would have been just as dazed and confused as the rest of the people to watch that week play out, to watch him betrayed, to watch him scourged, to watch him crucified, and to see him die. I might just walk away just like many of them did, shaking their head going, wow, we were wrong on that guy. And all the time, all the time, we are in the throes of victory. And when he rose again, and he shared that with the disciples and those who followed him, and it spread throughout the, the land, what had happened, it began to really change. It changed the world. It changed all of us and gave us all the hope for new life. And that, I hope that for you. I hope that's in your heart of hopes for yourself and for those you love. Let us pray this morning. Lord God, we love you. We do. We come here not only for worship, but a sense that we are in some way closer to you, that we can hear your voice. We can be in your presence in a way that, that takes us away from the world and all that pressures us there. And we can allow ourselves to be touched by you, by blessing us, holding us close, and loving us in a way the world cannot. And we are so thankful for this in your precious name. Amen. Well, as the end of our service already, it ends too quickly, I'm afraid, until we can all gather and do more stuff. But uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of our service. Uh, have a uh, blessing as you leave uh, for this holy week, and, and if you'll receive it, please. Lord God, we ask your blessing upon us as we leave this place. As we go through this week, uh, may we, we, you draw us close to you. May we see your journey through this week and, and better understand what your sacrifice means. That all of this had to be done to give us life, life eternal. Help us to accept that. Help us to be thankful for that. And help us to share that good news. In Jesus' name, amen. And go in peace.